you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be at 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, I really begin to really like this passage, obviously, because it's our third week since Easter that we've been on it. I actually could spend weeks and weeks and weeks talking about this and, and not get to the full depth of it. But we're looking at building on the resurrection of uh, uh, the resurrection of Christ changed so many things. God's grace is so amazing. Uh, to know where we are, are and how God has forgiven us, it is simply, simply amazing what God does in our life. But just as a, a way of review, as we begin looking at 1 Corinthians Verses 1 through 8 gave us the evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Uh, it's what we looked at about three weeks ago. That, that the uh, first evidence was it was prophesied in the Old Testament. Uh, it says repeatedly according to the scripture. And the events that were going to happen at the, the resurrection happened, uh, was written about 600 years before the actual event took place. And then we have the eyewitness accounts that Jesus was seen over... Uh, a period of time for, by over 500 people. And then the third evidence was the growth of the church. And we looked at those because you have to have something that you can settle, rest your faith on, and then stand on it. And then knowing deep down in your heart and mind that the resurrection is real, that Jesus rose from the dead, and because of that we can have life, we build off of that. We begin to build on that reality because of what Jesus has done for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19 is where we're going to be again. And it's the seven consequences of there not being a, a resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 says this. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead... Uh, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you'd be with us these next few minutes as we look into your word. Father, I pray you'd help us to examine our hearts and our lives and really see if we're living and embracing everything that the resurrection is. If, realizing that, that we are not dead, that we are not alone, that we are not orphaned. But God, because of your great grace and mercy and love in us, we live and can be called children of God. Help us to really see what victory we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So over those seven verses, Paul lays out seven out outcomes or seven realities of not believing in the resurrection. And the seven realities come down to the fact that the Christian himself is hopeless without Christ. So they are, and they're in your notes if you, if you want to look at them. But those seven realities come down to this. Christ is dead. Preaching is worthless. Faith is meaningless. Sin is unbeatable. Your loved ones who have died are gone. Christianity is pathetic and you are hopeless. And we looked at those first two last week. The first one, uh, the first one was Christ is dead. If Christ is dead then there, there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And so therefore, there's no really reason to go on any further. Verse 14 says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So preaching is worthless. So there's just basically, we come down to talking about why bother? Why bother doing any of this? Why, why not sleep in and just call it a day? Why bother? And then we come to verse 
16 and it says, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. So, the consequences of being dead and there being no resurrection, Christ is dead, preaching is worthless. The two that we're going to look at this morning, faith is meaningless and sin is unbeatable. Sin is unbeatable. So those are the two that we're going to look at this morning. Number three is faith is meaningless. In, in verse 14 and verse 17, it both speaks about faith. It says faith is useless and faith is futile. The word useless means to be empty-handed or without anything. There's just nothing there. The word futile means to have no value. And so our faith with no resurrection, without any resurrection is nothing at all. It has absolutely no meaning. And so that's one of the big problems when you start denying the fact that the resurrection can happen. But the most troubling one is number four, and that is sin is unbeatable. If there is no resurrection, then sin is not defeated. In fact, it's not even beatable. And there's four realities that we're going to look at if sin is unbeatable. You're dead in your sins. You're a slave to sin. You're alone and you're abandoned. Those are the four realities that come about if sin is unbeatable. Which means this. The things that I have going on in my life, the things that trouble me, my bad habits, my, the, the things that I do that I shouldn't do, I cannot get past that. If sin is undefeatable, I can't get past those things that are my hang-ups. If sin is defeatable, then I can look at my life where it is right now and realize that God has more for me, that he hasn't left me where I am, that he's got something better for me. So those are the four things that we're going to look at this morning. The, the, the reality that if sin is undefeatable, you're dead, you're a slave, you're alone, and you're damned. The first one, and it's the hardest one to get your mind around, is that you are dead. Now, these aren't the most pleasant things to, listen, to list out, but we'll get to the other side of this and you'll see why. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.1, and you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. If we are in our sins, then we are still dead. There's nothing we can do about it. We're dead. We often lose the reality of how completely unable we are to respond to God or the things of God because we're dead. So without the resurrection, we're dead. And that's something that we cannot relate to because we don't see things that are dead come alive. Now listen to this, and I want you to think about it. Everything in our world that we know is alive, and then it dies. If you go into your house and you look at your fish bowl, and your fish is starting to float upside down in the bowl, your fish is about to die. It was alive, and it is about to die. Same way with your pet. If your dog doesn't come and, and want any more food, and if it's not looking for your affection, your pet, you've lost it. It has died. In our world, things are alive, and then they die. Okay? That's what we're used to seeing. What the Bible says is that you are dead... And you come to life, which is totally opposite of anything that we know. There's no way for us to wrap our minds around something that has been dead and now it is alive. Even the examples that we see throughout the Bible trying to describe this, like a seed. When a, when, when a seed falls to the ground, there's nothing there. But there is life in that seed, and when that seed grows, it becomes something. But nowhere in reality or in this world do we see where something that is completely dead be brought back to life. That is what Jesus does in a person's life. Their soul is dead. There is a piece of you that is completely dead. And what God does in Christ Jesus is he brings it to life. 
That's what actually happens in a person's life. They are dead, and then they are brought back to life. You see, that's the reason that the Bible says that sin is unbeatable. If sin is unbeatable, then you're still dead. And we have no recourse. There's nothing that we can do because we are dead. We have no way of responding to anything because we are dead. We are spiritually dead. It is only when Christ, we meet Christ and he calls us that we are made alive. It says, if Christ has been raised, then the dead are not raised and you are still in your sins. That means that the unbeliever is spiritually not alive at all. And for that matter, they never can be. Unless someone intervenes on their behalf, they have no hope. And we see this in the world today where people do everything they can to try to feel alive. To, to try, to, to, try to, uh, to make their life work for them. And then no matter how much they try, they can't do it. They try to find belonging. They try to find purpose. And you can't do it. And people want God very often to accept them the way they are. People want others to accept them just the way they are. It's just such a big thing today. Why can't you just accept me the way I am? That's what people want. And it doesn't matter what it is. You just have to be loving and accepting to whatever lifestyle, whatever choices they make, whatever they feel like. It's their right, it's their choice, and you need to accept them for that. Folks, you will find that nowhere in the Bible to accept people just the way they are. I want you to hear me say this again. You will find nowhere in the Bible where you accept people just the way they are. That is a lie that we have been told. Jesus said, come to me just as you are. That's the truth. But you leave changed. You don't come to Jesus and stay the same. You come to Jesus and you leave changed. He wants to do a work in your heart and your life. And when we tell people, God will accept you however you are. That's not true. God invites you however you are. And then He's going to change you. He wants to do a work in your heart and life. He's not going to leave you the same. It would be wrong for Him to leave you the same. Why? Because the Bible says that you are dead. Okay? It would be like having somebody, if you could, somebody come up and go, I'm dead, but I don't want to be brought back to life. But I want you to like me just the way I am. I can't do that because you're dead. I can't accept you in because you are dead where you are. I want to make you alive. You see, a lot of times we leave out the idea of repentance and change. When we come to Jesus, what we come in is His grace and mercy that He will change us into what He wants us to be, not to accept us just as we are. There is a huge difference between this. And a lot of believers, well, God will just accept you however you are. You just come. He will invite you to come just as you are. And then he's going to change you. Man, so how many of y'all felt his scrub brush before? Woo! Boy, he goes to working on you. It's like you become his child. you got dirt behind your ears. We're going to get that out of there. He'll start working on you. He works hard. He'll get you all cleaned up. Whew. Listen, when you come to Jesus, you feel clean in a way that you had never felt clean before. Why? Because he's the cleaner. He said, I invite you to come, and then I'm going to clean you up. That's what Jesus does, and that's what repentance is. It's me saying, hey, God, forgive me for who I am. Change me. Make me new. And he said, I'll be happy to do that. So God doesn't accept us just at face value the way we are. We come to Christ, and he wants to change us in what he wants us to be because we are spiritually dead. It would be no different than going to an oncologist or a cancer doctor and him saying, I'm sorry, I have news for you, but you have cancer. And the person saying, 
I want you to tell me that everything is going to be okay and I can just keep going like I'm going and everything be all right. The doctor will say something like, what you have is going to kill you. I have to treat you. And you go, no, I don't want you to treat me. I want you to tell me I'm going to be okay. That everything's going to be all right. And, and I can just go on with my life. Now, what kind of doctor would look at that person and go, all right. If that's what you want, you're fine. Go on. No, a doctor would be doing everybody a disservice to look at a person who is in that condition and go, yeah, I, I think you're just fine. So you just go on. And so many Christians have bought into the lies that people can come however they want, not be changed, go out the other side and live their life. God never said that. God wants you to come because you are dead. You cannot respond to God. You have no capacity to respond to God. When God calls your name and you say yes, He's going to change you immediately. That's what He does. He doesn't leave you the same. How unjust, how inhumane, how mean God would have to be to say, ah, you can come to, you can come to me however you want to. I'll leave you just like you are. I don't want to change a thing. Why, you're great. That would be cruel. And so many people have bought into the lie that God will take them however they are and they can just come. Listen, pastors, church leaders need to tell people the truth. And the truth is, you are dead. And unless you receive Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, you will remain dead. And there is nothing that you can do about it. And so many people, well, well, if I work at it hard enough and I'm a good enough person, if I can do these things, and then, then I'll be okay. But the Bible says that our righteousness is filthy rags. We have no capacity in ourselves to make ourselves spiritually alive. Only Jesus can make us alive. Romans 8, 11 says this, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, that is the prerequisite to go into heaven, not be being good, doing a lot of right things, anything like that. It is the Spirit of God living in me who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. What makes a person fit to go to heaven is the Spirit of God implanted in your soul by God on account of your belief in Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, and nothing else. What makes me fit to go to heaven is the Spirit of God in me. You say, if I'm a good husband, can I go to heaven? No, because you're dead. If I work hard, does that make me good enough to go to heaven? No, it's because you were dead. If I give everything away that I have, will that make me good enough to go to heaven? No, because you're dead. If I die for Jesus as a martyr and I tell all these people how to be saved, will that get me into heaven? No. It's because you're dead. You see, what people don't realize is when we are separated from God, we're not kind of separated from God. God is alive and we are dead. It's just not what it amounts to. And people in our world will do everything they can to make that place in their heart feel like it's okay because we all and, it, it, and it's been described a lot we, we have an empty spot in our soul where we're God we got a dead place that that only Christ can fill in our hearts and lives and we have to invite him in to do this you know people try to drink life into their soul they try to use drugs to awaken their soul they try different relationships to excite their soul they try to work for success to awaken their soul. They, they try to entertain themselves to amuse their soul. They'll do all kinds of stuff to satisfy this yucky spot in their life. This place that they just can't do nothing with. It, it, it is an itch that they can't scratch. And, and no matter what you try to put in this spot, 
to give your life meaning and purpose, there's absolutely nothing that will work except Jesus. That is the thing that works in a person's heart and life that makes the whole thing make sense. And nothing else. If you don't have Jesus in your heart and life, there is nothing you can do to make that spot right. There's just absolutely nothing you can do. No matter how hard you try to fill it, no matter how much you try to entertain it, only Jesus works. And while these things may bring some temporary relief from the darkness, it ultimately cannot satisfy that longing in your soul. It's only when a person is made alive in Christ, when they really feel alive, for that person to embrace everything that God has for you. You have to accept Jesus. There's nothing else. And when you accept Jesus, there's something remarkable that happens. I was thinking about this. How do you, how do you describe going from being dead to alive? You know, there's absolutely, if you look for an illustration, there's absolutely nothing that can really adequately describe what being dead and coming back to life is. I mean, Lazarus could tell you, but there's very few people that that's like. So, I was doing the best I could. I was scratching my noggin. What can I do to illustrate this somehow? I want you to think about this. I used to play a game with the kids where we would be in the pool and we would go and uh, we could see who could hold their breath the longest. How many of y'all played that game in the pool before? I'm on, everybody has, right? Almost everybody. Okay, hands down. Is there anybody that hasn't played that game? Okay, good. Everybody's played that game. So what we would do, and, and how many of you in here have to win at all cost? You got to win. It doesn't matter what the game is. You got to win. Okay. You got to win at all costs. I don't care how long my kids can hold their breath. I'll hold it longer. So this is, this is the game that we're playing. And so I decided, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to float over to the deep end of the pool. And when, when we say go, I'm going to take my deep breath and I'm going to go straight down. And I'm going to sit on the bottom of the pool. And that's what I did. One, two, three. And I held my breath. And, well... Y- you have, to, you have to kind of let your, you don't sink immediately because you got all your breath in. And, and then I started letting all the air out. And so about, about 30 seconds into this game, you let all your air out. And then you can, you can float to the bottom, set Indian style on the bottom of the pool. You can sit and look around and everything's great. You're sitting there and somewhere about a minute gets there and you start feeling a little bit uncomfortable. You can... Everybody can make it about a minute or so. And then somewhere about the minute and a half range, you start to get really uncomfortable. Okay? But we're going to win. Amen? We're going to win at all cost. Right? Come on, let me hear you winners. We're going to win. Amen? We're going to win at all costs. And so you cro- I crossed my legs and I was sitting there uh, with all Indian style at the bottom of the pool. And uh, I'm waiting for the kids to give up, waiting for the kids to give up. Surely they've given up by now. I can still see their little legs. I don't know. So we pass by about the two-minute mark. Now, at two minutes... you. Some of y'all can go ahead and hold your breath in here if you want to. Just look at your watch, and I'll give you two minutes. You can hold your breath in you. You start really starting to feel the pain uh, because there's something inside of you that's alive that just wants to take another breath of air. You really start. Some, I don't know. Some people can hold their breath longer than that, but about the two-minute mark, you're starting to get panicked. Well... I stayed down there just a bit too long. But you know where this story was going anyway, right? And so I kick off the bottom of the pool and I start swimming to the surface. And it seems like forever before I get to the surface of the water again. And when I get to the top of the water, you take one of those big long... (gasps) And you breathe life in. Okay? 
That is the way it feels when you give your heart and life to Jesus. That's the best thing. When you go from being dead to being alive in Christ, it's like you come to the top of the water and go, oh, I can breathe again. There is life back where it was. When everything was closing in and dark. And let me tell you something. When you're without Christ, I was listening to the radio this week, and a person described it. It is like being in a deep, dark pit, and you're looking up at anywhere you can see light, hoping that something can pull you out. Because you are in this dark place, and it is called being spiritually dead. It is called having a place in your heart and life that only God can touch, and you're looking for something that will work, and you finally say yes to Jesus, and your soul and your spirit take a big, long, deep breath and go, oh, I'm alive. And for every person that's ever accepted Jesus, you can say that. I know, I know exactly what you're talking about because all of the sudden I felt clean. I felt clean like I never felt. Can I get a witness? How many of y'all say, I know what it feels like to be clean. I know what that clean feeling is. I know what it's like to take that deep, long breath and go, I'm alive. You see, when Jesus, when the Spirit of God comes into your heart and life, there is nothing, there is no Think nothing that can describe the way that feels. And if you have never experienced that feeling this morning of taking that first breath of being really alive and that first feeling of really being clean, that is the grace of God working in your heart and life and the Spirit of God coming and living inside of you. And you know it when it happens. God makes you alive. You are no longer dead, but you become alive. Number two. You're no longer a slave. Verse 17 says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're, you're still in your sin. You're not a slave anymore. John 8, 34 says this, Jesus replied, Verily truly I tell you, everyone who, is, who sins is a slave to sin. What that means is without Christ, we are mastered by our desires and passions. We are controlled by the things around us. And we see this in our world today all the time. Where people define themselves, where people define themselves by what they do. They define themselves by their particular vice that they have. And so that becomes their identity. As believers, our identity is in Christ. It is not in what we do. It is not in how we act. Our identity is in Jesus what matters to them in the world is the particular sin which they define themselves by. And so you have people celebrating today. If you watch the news, what you'll see is people celebrating different aspects of their lifestyle, their choices, because they have no other way to identify themselves. Hear me on this. They have no way to identify who they are other than by what they do. So I was listening to, and I'll just go ahead and, and, and kind of break it, what, what was going on here. There was this lady that was talking on the radio. She happened to be a Republican who was black, and she was a, a lady, and she was listening, and, and she was talking on the radio. And this is what she said. When they, she, she said, listen, me being a Republican or a Democrat does not define who I am. Me being white, brown, or black person does not define who I am. Me being a male or a female does not define who I am. Being a child of God defines who I am. And the most important thing about me is that I am a child of the King. I'm a child of the Maker of heaven and earth. I'm a child of the Creator of all things. And I am dearly beloved by Him. You see... When we stop identifying ourselves by all of these different categories, you see, what, what's happening in our world, everybody's got their categories, their list of categories that they fit into, and, and somebody will say, well, this category don't like this category, and this one doesn't. Everybody's fighting. Why? Because we have lost our identity in Christ. Who are you? I'm a child of God, that's who I am, and nothing else. 
You know that's the only thing that matters about me? This whole, you can put me in any box that you want to, but the only thing that I need to ever identify myself is as being a child of God. It's the only one that matters. Nothing else matters. Not my race, my color, my creed, anything else. It doesn't matter my political affiliation. None of that matters. What matters is I'm a child of God. You know, it would do churches really well to realize that. And, and churches come together and say, you know what matters about us? It's not our race. It's not our, our culture. It's not our, our background. It's, it's, it's we are all children of God. And because we are children of God, we love each other as children of God. And we love a lost world as children of God. And when churches start treating everybody like that, that we are the child of God, then our world can come back together again. What it is is we've lost. Everybody's all stirred up and mad at everybody else. When we need to say boldly, I'm a child of the king. That's who I am. And that's all that matters. And if Christ has been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. What tears people down is their sin. The thing that gets into their life, that robs them of their identity in Christ. And even believers can fall into this trap as well, where you start identifying yourself by what you're doing. Well, I've I've, I've, I've got a, a drinking problem, or I... I've got a, 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 an envy problem. I've got a lust problem. I've I got an anger issue. I've, I, I've got these things in my life that I'm dealing with. And everybody has those things in their life that they're dealing with. But when you start identifying yourself by those things that you're having problems with, what ends up happening is you forget the fact that you're a child of the king. That you're a child of God. When you're a child of God, that is the only thing that matters. You say, well, I, I still mess up. Who doesn't mess up from time to time? Who doesn't make a mistake? But our identity is in Him. You know what kids need now more than ever? You parents, you grandparents, you know what your kids need to hear? The thing that kids need is a mom who loves Jesus who knows that she is a child of God. They need a dad who loves Jesus and knows they are a child of God. And they need to love their kids and tell them, when you give your heart and life to Jesus, you'll be a child of God too. And we will build homes, strong homes, based on the fact that we belong to the King. Change our world. We have so many people suffering from identity crisis. And they're all messed up because of it. Without him, you are a slave to sin. The sin that controls you. And the Bible says that we are no longer that. Romans 6, 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him. The old man that I used to be was crucified with him. So that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should be no longer slaves to sin. Don't let anything take you back. You say, well, I can't help it. Yes, you can. Don't let absolutely anything control who you are. Why? Because you're a child of God and you don't have to. That means when whatever whatever particular uh, you used to get by with the pressures of life, whatever the thing was that was... To, to, to mitigate my pain, uh, I'm a child of God now, and I don't have to put up with that because God, Christ in me, can fix those things. Christ in me. That, so what ends up happening is as I'm walking along, uh, something will go, hey, Brian, you know, uh, I know you're having a stressful day right now and things are busy, and so why don't you just... Why don't you just go over here and take it easy for a while? Let, let, let your mind, maybe you need to go, maybe, maybe we just need to get really mad at somebody and talk about them behind their back. That, that's fine. You can do that. Or, or if you want to lust about something, you just go do that. that, that no, everybody will understand because it's, it's all the pressure that you got going on. You need to take care of that. Or, 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 or maybe you just need to go on a shopping spree. Or do, why, don't, why don't we go call and, and talk about some people on the phone or whatever. And so what ends up happening is all of those vices that we may have had in the past, they start whispering in our ears. That is your old 
slave master telling you what he wants you to do. It is the world of flesh and the grave whispering in your ear. You, you know what? You, your life is so hard, you just need to be disappointed. You know what I'd be? I'd be if my life were going like yours, I'd be afraid right now. Mm -hmm. The world's crazy. Things are looking bad. And you know what? It's okay to be afraid because, hey, everybody understands. Hey, guess what? It's not okay to be afraid. It's not okay to lust. It's not okay to, to get mad at people and stay angry at them. It's not okay. And if you're doing that, you're listening to the voice of your old master. Trying to pull you away from who you are. You know what you say as a child of God? No. No. I don't have to listen to you. Yeah, you do. Your flesh, the world, and Satan will come to you and say, Hey, man, you got to do this. You, 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 you got to do it. This is, this, is what, this is what you used to do. This is, this is who you are. He said, No, it's not. No, it's not. You see, now, I'm not going to ask everybody to raise your hand, but if you say, Yeah, I, I've got it. If I, I will admit it. I have a lust problem, okay? If I were to ask everybody in here, you men, how many of you have a lust problem? Don't raise your hand because here's the thing. I already know you do, okay? Statistically speaking, they did a promise keeper's thing where it was all good Christian men. And how many of them actually had a, a lust problem? It was like 70 or 80%. Uh, the men that would actually admit, yeah, I, I got one. Okay, there's tons of men who use lust as a crutch to live their life. There, there, there's all kinds of vices that happen in our world where people use things to get them through life. If I were to ask you ladies, how many of y'all worry all the time? You always got something to worry about. That's not from God either. If, if I ask you, how many of you stay angry at somebody and it's like, it just boils in your mind all the time over and over and over. That's not from God either. God does not want you doing that because you are responding to your old master. You are no longer a slave. What do you do? You tell them to get lost. As soon as, that mind, as soon as that thought comes into your mind, you just say, no, not happening today. Uh -uh, I'm a child of God. Let me tell you something. If you want to run your anger problem, your lust problem, your envy problem, your gossip problem, if you want to run it away, as soon as it pops in your mind, you say, no, I'm a child of God. It runs it off. It will, I promise you. It will run it off. I'm a child of God. Your identity, your relationship with Jesus defines who you are. You don't have to put up with it anymore at all. It is not in, you are not controlled by it, period. God's grace and mercy has entered into your life. You do not belong to Him. They cannot tell you what to do. Tell them to get lost. Amen? I don't want to tell them to get lost. You tell them to get lost. You're better than that. Your identity is in Christ. Romans 8.37, which the middle part of the part that Wayne alluded to earlier, says, No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. How many of you this morning feel like you're more than a conqueror? Hmm? Anybody? You feel like, I got this. I'm more than a conqueror. I got this. You see, as believers, we all need to be able to raise our hand up and go, you know what? I got this. And I ain't got it because I've got it. I've got it because he's got it. I am more than a conqueror because of who I am in Christ Jesus. That's who I am. You are dead. You're a slave. The third thing the consequence of sin being undefeatable is you're alone. I can't think of anything worse than going through this life alone without God. Being alone without Him in my life, knowing that He's there, He's touching my life, He's guiding my path, He's, he's, he's watching out for me and everything. When we become a child of God, we are never, ever, ever alone. Why don't you come on, go ahead and get us a song ready. I'm not going to be able to finish this morning because I'm not going to be able to finish. But, 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 but John 14, 18 says, I will never leave you as an orphan, but I will come to you. Hebrews 13, 5 says this. God says, I will never leave you, 
nor forsake you. Everybody standing. This is what I want us to do this morning. I don't know where you are, and I don't know what your problem is. Can we start off with just the chorus? Sure can. I want to, I want to, we are going to sing victory in Jesus. That is our invitation hymn. That is our anthem this morning. Let me tell you, I don't care what it is. If you need to be saved this morning, you come. I want to tell you how you can be saved if you don't have victory in Jesus. If you're here this morning and there is anything at all that is holding you back from being everything that God wants you to be, I want you to come in just a minute. I want you to come and say, God, I want to experience that victory. If it is fear that has got you bound down, if it is some trouble in your life, I want you to claim that victory in Jesus right now. Don't wait a second. Claim that victory because your identity is in Him. Your identity is in Him. Let's go ahead. Let's sing it. Victory in Jesus. If you got victory this morning, you sing it out right now. If not, you come. <laughs> 